Delaware County Historical Society's Oral History of the Little Brown Jug Race. And we are pleased to be able to interview Phil Terry, P-H-I-L-T-E-R-R-Y. Today is August the 7th, 2020. We're in the log cabin at the Delaware County Fairgrounds in Delaware. Phil, thank you very much for being willing to participate. More than welcome. Happy to. I'm, I'm glad. Um, so I'm going to go way back with you. Uh, when you were a student at Ohio Wesleyan, this is back to 1968, I think, and you were directing traffic. Yeah, in 1968, Wesleyan started late. And so I came up to the fairgrounds and got a job from John Brown, who was a longtime board member. He was also the employer for everybody that worked the fair. And uh, he asked me, you know, what can I do? Whatever you want. And he says, do you have a uniform? And the guy standing right behind me was uh, National Guard. I said, no. He says, I'm about your size. I got, I got the uniform you can wear. So uh, they signed me to the front gate at uh, the main entrance to work traffic. And I started traffic at uh, like, well, except for jug day, it was at six. But uh, normally about eight. And uh, at that time, all the traffic came in through the mutt gate, front gate. We didn't use any other gates. Uh, and I worked eight hours a day, except drug day, and it was uh, 14, I think. Uh, I was totally amazed, because this was my first experience to be in the Delaware Fair, didn't know anything about the Little Brown Jug or anything. And uh, I was just amazed at the cars coming in. This big Cadillac pulled up. He's got a big set of horns, cattle horns, on the front of his, <laughs> front of his thing, and he's, <coughs> excuse me, he waved his, oh, he waved his uh, hand down to come over to him. And I did, and he gets, gets me a little bottle of uh, uh, bourbon. He says, you're gonna need this tonight. <laughs> and I uh, asked him his name, he said he was Chester Alt. The reason I break that up is that uh, years ago, or years later, when I was uh, appointed the uh, director of uh, marketing, Charles was one of my first representatives that I got to come on as a sponsor. And he remembered that day. <laughs> so anyhow, we, uh, about four o'clock in the afternoon, I got a break. So I went up to the fairground, up to the uh, grandstand, went on my way up through the uh, crowd and was able to stand up. I was totally amazed at the number of people that were there and how much fun they were having. And, uh, listening to the crowd respond to the races and respond to Roger was just, it was amazing. I said, I'm gonna do this again. <laughs> and I have ever since. So you haven't missed a jug? No, I have not missed a jug. Um, so as I understand that in 1984, you became uh, the security uh, chief uh, and that's because you were part of the Delaware Police Department, Police Department yes. correct? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you got the job to be the security chief for the jug? Well, in 1983, we had the starting gate accident. Uh, happened right over in the turn just before the paddock. And the gate had gone, that had not closed. And there were a lot of people hurt. Etc. And I was sitting up in the box seat with my father-in-law and my wife, Katie. I got, and I was in uniform because I was going back on, I was going on to traffic duty as soon as the jug was over. 
Well, I got out of the grandstand, jumped the fence, went over to where the accident happened. And I was the first person of any recognition as far as being an authority or anything to arrive there. Uh, the squads, everybody else had a hard time getting there because back then the parking, uh, parking proposition at, 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 at the fairgrounds on Jug Day, just keep driving as close as you can. <laughs> when you can't get any closer, get out of the car. And that's what they had done. You could not move an emergency vehicle around. They ended up having to bring everybody in over, uh, through the paddock and stretchers over the top of the gate or top of the fence, etc. So anyhow, uh, the board decided at that time that they needed to do something else, something different for their security and safety. So they had talked to uh, my chief, Chief Browning, and my captain, Ron Poulton. Uh, Ron wanted to recommend somebody that could work be a security. And they mentioned me because my father-in-law had horses and was racing. Uh, Katie is a longtime Delaware resident. So they asked, uh, they interviewed me, and they asked me whether well, the three guys were Bill Lowe, which was his first year of being fair manager at the time, uh, Tommy Thompson, and uh, John Wolf. The interview went very well. I was happy to talk with him, and, and I told him three things I needed if I was going to do this. One was I needed six golf carts so that officers could move around freely on the fairgrounds without having to drive through all the mess. Needed six radios so that they could communicate with each other rather than, you know, if I see them, I'll tell them something. And the third thing I asked the board for is that their full support. You tell me what you need. I'll tell you what we're going to do. If you agree to it, then that's what we're going to do. We're not going to change, uh, change the way why we're doing it. If we don't like something we did, we'll fix it for next year. And they agreed to that. So with that, said so you can't much, that's what you need. So uh, 84 was my first year <laughs> and we made an awful lot of changes. I created new traffic patterns. Uh, we created fire lanes so that people could get, emergency vehicles could move around. Uh, and I eliminated parking from inside, all vehicle to the outside. I didn't change it that year, but I got them, I could finally convinced them that we needed to close the front gate to traffic. They needed to come in from either the west or the east side of the fairgrounds, because that's where the cars are going to park. Let's don't have the cars driving through people. And they agreed to that. There was a lot of uh, objection to that. Well, we've always done that. That's a very common phrase that you'll hear at fairgrounds. We've always done that. Probably hear it elsewhere too, but that's what we've always done. I said, well, we're not going to do it again. Uh, that first year, I had one guy who is an executive in the racing business. He had uh, built a couple tracks, done some, managed a bunch of tracks. Uh, and his horse was here, and their party area was over in D-Bart, which is on the west side of the track. I towed his car three times. <laughs> we towed a lot of cars that first year, especially. We had a large, what we called the impound lot, and uh, we just took them back there, dumped them, and the person came, my car's gone. I said, well, it's back over there someplace, go find it. We didn't charge anybody or anything, just you get a walk <laughs> to go find your car. Uh, but that's, you know, changes did not go well. Uh, with the partic with the the people, you know, the fans. Yeah. Uh, most common phrase I would have heard is, "Well, I've always done that." Or we and Bill Lowe and I developed the the first three rules of <laughs> fair. <laughs> I've always done that before. Got to be the closest, and I need to be the first to get there. Uh, 
after the first year, we developed another, another the fourth rule, rule, which was, it's a good rule for everybody else, <laughs> but you can't be me. Uh, and that was the attitude, but the guy that I talked about that I towed his car three times that first year, two years later, he came up to me and says, Phil, I got to tell you, you were paying a buck, but the changes you've made are great. I'm going to use this kind of approach from now on at his tracks. Because uh, it need, just needed an organization, that's all it needed. And today, you know, I think there's uh, about 120 golf carts on the fairgrounds <laughs> and over 100 radios because they just found it so much better to be able to communicate. One of the things that you just mentioned was about close. And uh, in other people's interviews, when we've asked, you know, what makes this race unusual, special, they brought up the fact that there's this intimate relationship between the fans and, well, everything that goes on. So I'm assuming that there was some tension that you experienced between what's safe and what's close, what's intimate. Oh, there and, was. And, and I'm wondering how you thought through the balance of those two things. Anytime we made a change, we thought, okay, what's gonna happen here? What's, what are we gonna have to do? Signage helped a, lot, a whole lot. And sometimes just talking with people, explaining why this is, why we're doing this. Right. And normally they would see the reason and say, okay, so while there's some arguments about it, uh, other things, uh, the, the east side of the fairgrounds, or the trap, is where they used to build their scaffolding, they still do. So they could sit up over the bank and watch. Well, I made some changes there and I ended up having all the scaffolding be inspected by the, by the county to make sure that they were safe for people to be on, because they weren't. <laughs> they weren't. Uh, generally speaking, the people thought, that once they understood why the changes were done and they saw that it was safer for the uh, for them and the participants and safe for the for the drivers and the participants in the race uh, they got along with it okay I still must say just uh, as, a, as a, a complete outsider um, I don't think there is another sporting event where a fan can get as close to the main participants, to, to, to basically come up to the horses, to the drivers, whatever. And, and I don't think that that's true at any other harness racing. No, it's not. It's very restricted at most, most tracks. The reason it's restricted at most tracks is because they're abiding by racing commission rules. Like you can't, people, fans cannot be where the horses are. Uh, fans cannot be at the paddock. They, those kinds of things. Whereas here, our philosophy is, is that we want people to be able to see the horse up close, talk to the drivers, the trainers, uh, as much as possible, so that they get the true enjoyment of the, of the, of the, of the animal and the people participating. Uh, and especially became, at first, before we had the jug barn and then the jug at barn, jug horses were sort of scattered throughout the rest of the stables. And it made it harder for people to find a horse or a driver or stuff. But then we got Tom Walsh contributed money for his allowance to build the uh, uh, jug barn. I loved one of Tom's quotes. The Delaware County Fair, the jug, were a bright light in a dimming image. Uh, and that made it a lot easier for the people to go. We had open house in the barns. Uh, people could come in and tour. You'd have throughout the course of the day, we'd have on Jug Day uh, as many as fifteen thousand people would walk through the Jug Barn to see the horses, and it was very controlled. People liked it. They did. They, John, the, the drivers and the trainers mostly were very willing to come up and talk with people and visit. 
And then when we got closer to the racing time, we'd close it down. And they understood that because they needed to go get their seat. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that, you know, the way we sit here, we completely surround the track. Again, that's not allowed at, a, at most racing venues. So we got, you know, I have people completely around the track. Uh, and they enjoy that. They hear, they hear the horse, they hear the drivers yelling at each other. It's uh, the closest contact they can have with racing on a normal occasion. And they get to see the best in the world right there. Indeed they do. Um, and, and I mean, you have seen lots of races. Yes, I have. <laughs> You've seen uh, every jug for more than 50 years. Yep. In, in your mind, are there a couple that are really memorable? <coughs> for me, uh, I've got three. One of them was the was uh, Shady Character won the race. And Shady Character was the first horse to have been born and raised in Delaware County. So that, and they were neighbors just down the road from us. So that was sort of, that. I thought that was pretty important for me to have a local involvement like that. But the two races that I really remember is the race with Life Sign winning and then with Wiggle It, Jiggle It. Life Sign had been racing against three top horses uh, that had uh, been very, they were all very dominant and they'd all racing at different places, different locales. So they never had come all four together and until they came to the jug. The three other horses were all owned or trained by one man. And then Gene Regal, who was a local Ohio person and we loved him, uh, had life sign. John Campbell was driving life sign, which we all love too. Probably one of the best drivers we've ever seen. And I, John, and it was it was a heck of a race. Uh, each one of the other three horses came at him once, and they'd pull up on him, get past, and the life sign had come back. Another horse would do the same thing, <laughs> and John ended up winning by a. Uh, uh, by head, and I talked with him later, and he'll tell you, and I've heard him in several speeches, he said that was the worst drive I ever did. <laughs> Since I used the horse three times, and you can't do that. <laughs> but he did. And life sign, hang on, I want it. But it was big because he was, it was, Gene Regal was a big horse person, and he was important to Ohio because he was from Greenville, Ohio, and he had several good horses. And he trained for some of the best owners in the world. Brittany Farms uh, had life sign. It was just a fantastic combination of people involved and the horse there. And I did a survey to celebrate the 65th jug in conjunction with uh, USTA hoofbeats and uh, the uh, magazine, uh, Horseman and Fair World. We did a survey of what was the best jug of by, by decade. And the life sign race was voted the top over all of them. Uh, then, what, four years ago? We could, 20, 2015. Yeah, 2015. Uh, a horse came along called Wiggle It, Jiggle It. The name caught everybody. They loved the name. And they just loved the horse. He was had something about him. He, he had an attitude. I never saw Wigglet stay still in the winning circle once. Uh, the trainer uh, and the driver, there were two guys from Delaware, the Chicks. Uh, that's Delaware State. Delaware State, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and they had great attitudes. They were just fun people to be with, uh, very sharing, easy to talk to. And when Wiggle It was a fantastic race, 
I was torn because I liked the name, I liked the horse and everything, but his main competitor was Lost for Words, who was trained by Brian Brown here on the Delaware County Fairgrounds. <laughs> so I was torn between, you know, and they were going at it. I mean, they did. Uh, one step before the finish, Lost for Words was winning. One step after the race, <laughs> Lost for Words was winning. But Wiglet got the head in at the finish. Uh, I had many, many long-time horsemen, fans, viewers, uh, that saw the race and said it was the best race they've ever, ever seen. Uh, and I, I had to agree with them. It was a fantastic race, and it, it, you could not be excited. And you know, one of the things with our, a lot of our races is that one of the things that, where the excitement happens is from Roger. If I haven't mentioned him, it's Roger Houston, our announcer. He'd been announcing for 50 plus years. Uh, I always said Roger could make a, a, a race between two frogs sound excited. He just has that way, and we, his nickname is The Voice. But anyhow, he said, and he's watched, he's called thousands of races. Watch more than that. And I think he'll still tell you today, that was the best race he's ever seen. Uh, the horses were just phenomenal. The drivers, we got a, uh, Montel Teague, young guy, I think he was probably 20, 21 at the time, son of the trainer, uh, going up against uh, the uh, very experienced driver that was on Lost for Words. And to see those two competing against each other, Montel showed himself very well. He says, I'm gonna be a good driver. Especially helps when you got a good horse. Indeed. And we watched we watched those two race against each other a number of times throughout the year and the next year too. But those are my two most favorite. Very good. Um, you bring up uh, the drivers. You mentioned John Campbell, um, that experienced driver who was with Lost for Words is David Miller. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and, and you go back to, uh, to other famous drivers. Um, if you were, again, going to put in the top one, two, three, something like that, of the drivers you've seen at the Jug, who, who would be in your Hall of Fame? Well, John Campbell would, would definitely be up there. Uh, David Miller, uh, they call him Jesus, Purple Jesus, that's his colors. <laughs> Uh, I don't even know how I got that name, but it was like if Miller was up, that was good. Uh, then Ron Pierce is another good driver. In the early years, which I did not have the pleasure of seeing, uh, Billy Helton and uh, Stanley Dancer, who I did not have the opportunity to actually see. I've seen him in film, but uh, when they were there, there was going to be a race. Uh, probably another, speaking of David, was a horse, a horse called Shadow Play, who won the jug in, I don't remember what year, but uh, David was driving Shadow Play, and we knew the trainer was Ian, uh, Ian, yeah, a Canadian guy, and when he won his division, when he came into the paddock, uh, he was late. So they had the vets with him and, and everything, and the uh, the vets said he had broken a quarter part of his uh, heel. Well, the, the uh, farrier came and worked on him, patched it up as best he could, reshoot him, 
and we didn't know if he was going to race or not. David, I watched David bringing him out of the paddock, going to the track. The horse was definitely lame. But that horse, when he got onto the track, when he touched the track, he just did what he was supposed to do. Nothing. <laughs> David took him out and for, for a lap around to see how he was. He says, we'll race him. And uh, they did. He won. Uh, David came off the track with the horse. And he's just flat lame now. Took him back. He spent three days here uh, after the race getting his heel and foot fixed as best they could before, uh, before they could move him. Uh, that's what I like about the standard bread. They're, uh, they're known for their endurance, they're known for their strength, and their attitude. They will do everything they can to win. They don't slow down, I don't care, that foot's hurting, I'm racing. The standard bread is a much bigger horse than like the thoroughbred as far as bulk. Uh, and they're known for their endurance as opposed to speed. But they're still pretty fast. Uh, and those probably might, I'll put those up. David drew that, and I don't mention that, but Miller drove that horse. And he had to choose because he had driven another horse in another division and he had to choose which horse he was going to drive and he was very nervous about it. He said, well, I'll take the horse, but is he going to make it to the track? That's why he took him on or out. I said, okay, we'll make it because uh, David's loyal to his, to his owners uh, and he's not going to just desert him because they think it might be better for themselves. Most of your drivers are like that. They will bond with their trainers and their owners and be there come hell or high water. Um, I'm going to change topics a little bit. Um, uh, Tommy Thompson, that's the, the son of Hank, um, was very important in your involvement in the jug. And uh, I'm just wondering what recollections you have of Mr. Thompson, uh, the kind of person he was, how he treated people. Could you talk a little bit about him? First of all, I'd say Tom was a gentleman, above all, above all things, he was a gentleman. He could uh, dress you down politely. <laughs> and you'd know that, oh, I don't know one of Tom's favorite expressions he used because he was a newspaper guy. Because you don't go to war with a guy that buys ink by the barrel. <laughs> but uh, Tom and I, we, we, we became friends. I had known him as being a police officer, and he's running the paper. But once, uh, once they hired me to do the security, I, became, I had to become you know, familiar with him, because a lot of the things I was doing was affecting his show. But we became very good friends, and we would travel a lot, and probably uh, those nights that we were traveling at races across the country, when it was all done, we're sitting back in the motel, uh, we'd sit and have a beverage, and we'd talk. That was some of my best education I could ever have, <laughs> was learning about the, because he taught me about, he taught me about the, the, the importance of racing as far as it goes to, to watch and to be a participant and to keep fans happy. What kind of things do you have to do? We worked a lot on promotions we could do. Uh, cause, and he just was a very good thing. And I always knew him as Tommy. <laughs> it was like a second time we're at a hotel together. I couldn't remember his room number, so I called down to the front desk. I said, Tommy Thompson, please. Uh, we don't have a Tommy Thompson here. Uh, well, yeah, we just checked in together. I have a Walter Thompson. I didn't even know Tom's first name. Uh, that's how, you know, he was always Tom or Tommy, one of the two. 
I never heard anybody else ever call him Walter. <laughs> uh, but nicknames are like that, you know. But we'd, uh, as we traveled across the country, we'd see what they do in other places. And during that process, Tom introduced me to the elites of the racing business. Uh, we go to the Hall of Fame meetings. Uh, we go to, uh, uh, they have a, what they call a Congress, where the thoroughbred, standard bred, quarter horse all meet for a week discussing their, because uh, a lot of things common with the horse, but a lot of things different. We didn't chance to learn the, learn the racing. And uh, he's the one that told me, he says, Phil, I want you to take over simulcast. We had we didn't simulcast. Simulcasting is when we show the make, show the races uh, out to the to the betting facilities, tracks, etc. And they bet on bet into us through that simulcast program. And I said, okay. <laughs> Our first year, my wife Katie and I uh, were calling tracks to get them to take our signal. And I found out quickly that they had no idea what they did at the Delaware County Fair as far as racing went. They had no concept of what heat racing was. Uh, and, because at that time, we, the first few years, we were heat racing more than just the jug. We would heat race the uh, three-year-old uh, OEC races. Uh, and one of the things about that is that on the same day, you've got horses coming back and race in a different, in a different organization. Might have been a, in the uh, first place, in the first race, they were assigned the fifth and second. So we had to uh, produce new, when we did it at fairgrounds, we were fine. We just, we'd have a page made up were all the possible horses that could be in it. And uh, then Roger would announce before the race, okay, here's your starters and the starting order for this, this race. And we, our fans handled it great because they were used to it. Been doing the heat recent ever since the uh, racing started as far as standard bird racing. The tracks and the ADWs, that's uh, automatic deposit waging. They had no concept of what we were doing. And that first year, we were, uh, we would fax, actually the first two years, we'd fax out the comeback sheets, that's what we called them, to all the tracks. We had it all set up to fax these out, but it wasn't very fast to get them out to them. And the uh, young man that I had brought on board with me to help, a name of Jason Settlemore, who's now the manager of the Meadowlands track in, uh, in Jersey. He said, Phil, I can do this via the internet. I can email everybody the comeback sheets at once, so they'll have it a lot quicker. And uh, boy, did that help. That really helped. Now, as, as, as we move forward, one of the things that we have to do here at, at Delaware is we have to adapt ourselves to work with the uh, what the industry is doing at that time. Industry as a whole was not heat racing anymore. The owners didn't want to do it, the drivers didn't want to do it, the trainers didn't want to do it, and it was harder to bet on. That's a key thing because that's where they make their money, the tracks. They make their money with betting. So those heat races went away because it just was cumbersome to, to bet on them. The, uh, where was I? So anyhow, we put together the simulcast program for Tom. And uh, I remember first year, <laughs> these people, when we called them, they said, what's that, a dog race? <laughs> no, it's not a dog race. <laughs> uh, Little Brown Jug name came from a, a, a 
horse from Tennessee back in the 1880s who was very good and they actually toured the, the country with him to do exhibition races uh, and out of a contest that they ran uh, back at the start of the jug, uh, Little Brown Jug was one of the nominations from somebody from Mount Vernon and uh, that's the one they selected because of the back history and et cetera. And we also had a, a song ready to go. Uh, when you got a jingle, make it work. <laughs> and uh, they did. And, it, you know, I think back, these gentlemen created a race, created an event, basically overnight. So, and it became the, one of the, the top races, I'll say the top race, in the standard bread business. And it just amazed me, you know, think of, you take three, four guys that could do that today, sit down and create a, create an event, this is what we're going to do, and, and have it happen? That's amazing. One of the people who made it happen was uh, Raleigh McNamara, uh, who uh, designed this uh, track with wide turns and uh, making it a pretty fast track. Yes. Um, did you have much contact with Mr. McMahon that is what Katie's great uncle? No, actually, it was they were they were cousins. Harold, okay. Katie's dad, and R.K. were first cousins. Gotcha. And uh, I never had the pleasure of really. I met him a couple times, but ever talking to him, R.K. I didn't. Now his daughter, Dorothea, I knew very well. And she she ended up, when she no, could no longer come to the races, she gave Katie the box that they had had, which is right on the finish line. <laughs> RK knew how to pick a box back then. <laughs> uh, and we were very happy to get that. And uh, Dorothea and Katie got along just extremely well. And it was uh, it was sort of fun to be able to keep the name yes. going, sort of, for that box. Uh, but he did. He designed a track really different than most people ever had. Sort of designed it to fit the grounds because originally there was a ravine uh, that flowed out of the uh, east end of where the track is. They had to fill that, but they created it, and and the thing. The track had going for it was had extremely wide turns, shorter track, shorter stretches, but the wide turn allows the horse to maintain speed. I remember uh, John Campbell was driving a horse in one of the races, and he passed the quarter pole, which is at the end of the back stretch. Uh, he was last. Out of that turn, he was in first. To be able to do that on a half mile track was rather amazing. But that's the way our track was built. And he had also, the material used on the track was Delaware clay. It is a very forgiving surface for the horse to race on. When a horse puts his foot down, there's a lot of pressure on that foot. It would go into the clay, and the clay will actually help rebound the hoof back out. It helps him on lifting that foot and coming out. Now, it all happens very quick. You have to hard time to say it, but it, but it does help the horse get the foot back up and ready to take its next stride. Uh, that Delaware clay is one of the things that decided to design, but that clay is one of the things that made this track so fast. Fastest half mile in the country, or in the world, really. Uh, one problem with clay tracks is that when they get wet, they are slippery. And I mean very slippery. One year we had a rainstorm and uh, we're watching, one of the officials came out to check the track, put one foot on that track and went right on his butt. <laughs> it was slippery. The cars, or the, the, the starting car, could not make a turn on it. 
And we had, when you have a rain, we used to have, when they had rain delays or something like that, it made no difference because everybody just come back the next day and start the party over. <laughs> I remember one rain day, uh, rainy day on Jug, that crowd, or the people here, they ran every bar in town out of booze. <laughs> <laughs> it was a heck of a party. <laughs> so anyhow, we had a guy who was at the race, and he had an idea. He names Greg Coon, Coon and Sons track designers. And he came to us with a uh, proposal that he could make not at all surface track, but a track that we could race on when it rained. Also, and still making use of the clay. What they do is they put the clay down and it's fairly hard. And on top of that, they put a small coating of sand. The sand gives the horse a grip if it's wet or not and allows him to, to race. And we did that in 1991, I think. Since that time, we've never had, to, we've never had a cancellation. And we've had one time we had a delay before it had rained and the track guys just wanted to redress the track. So they scraped the track and then put down new sand, which took a while to get done. The benefit of that is that more money was bet on that race after that because they had fans had nothing else to do except watch, the, watch them fix the track or go bet again. It was the highest bet race we've ever had. Uh, but that made a big difference to us because the business was changing. It used to be, you know, stables would travel from track to track, doing all the main grand circuit events, etc., of which Delaware Stop was a part of that. And they would bring their whole stable. Well, the business changed in that a trainer would have horses racing multiple places and would have a horse scheduled to race that was in the jug was also scheduled to race next the following week. The industry couldn't really stand for us to not race when we were supposed to. So with those, with those things, then we went. That's when we went to the sand on the right on the track, and it was very successful, and it made it much easier for everybody to schedule their horses where they're going to be because you know used to be the big horses to come to Delaware was the next to last stop for the Grand Circuit. From here they'd go to Lexington and the, that would conclude the Grand Circuit events. Uh, now big races are year round. Uh, and horses have to be able to hit their schedule where they're supposed to be because they're all racing for, for money. And it is a business. So that, that process we went through and changing that track uh, without changing it, was very important to, to us overall. Okay. Speaking of the business, um, so I noticed that the license tag that you have says Bet Jug, uh, that when you were the, um, the manager uh, or the director, I guess, of marketing, mm -hmm. uh, that was your main aim was to get, uh, what was it, butts in seats? Butts in seats or fans, yeah. They, actually, I gotta give credit to Tom Wright, okay. who, who, you always use the butts in seats. Okay. Uh, but I went along with it, because it's what we need. What, what were some of the things that you did in order to market the race? Uh, early on, I tried a lot of different things with uh, infant use of the internet. I created the uh, uh, Jug Future, where we would put in all the possibilities of horses that we think could be racing, and they could bet on them beforehand. I, I do a Jug Jug Future, uh, you know, the end of August, first of September, and then ready for the Jug, just to increase interest in the race more than just that week, because. We had to get beyond just, yeah, it's a jug week. It's the jug all the time. We uh, did a lot of advertising 
uh, promotions. I ran a promotion for a number of years uh, to bet uh, uh, we made create you could create a stable. Pick eight horses, two drivers, two trainers, and put them up for who you wanted to start in this particular race, and create points as they went through the went through the season. Uh, that was pretty. It was well liked. We had a lot of people that did that for a number of years. Uh, run different contests, like you know, running the uh, one for what was the best jug. Just thing to keep the name out there more than just that week. You went, you went to people thinking about the jug year round, not just not just that week. So they think about, oh, I got to get going to the jug. So that was, you know, just maintain that interest throughout the year uh, so that the name is there and we're ready to go. Now, having the best horses and having the best drivers doesn't hurt. <laughs> and one of our things, you know, I used to, one of my promos was that we have the best horses, we have the best drivers, trainers, we have the best drivers, and we also have the best fans. Uh, those four combinations make it uh, make it very important. We would produce crowds of excess of thousand, you know, forty, fifty thousand, whereas most tracks were, you know, happy to get on a big day maybe twenty. Uh, that was part of our reputation that we, and the reason we ever do that is because we let people all the way around the track. The back stretch, you'll have chairs. Tied to the uh, fence, all the way back to the you know you're 10, 15, 20 people deep, clear around the track. But uh, that's one of the things that I mentioned the fences. Interesting thing with that, I you know, people will come in and start. Normally, it's after uh, Memorial Day. They'll start coming to the fairgrounds and putting their chairs. Normally they're old rickety rackety ones. Uh, chain to the fence and their positions because that's going to be their year. And, and it was interesting. You could watch them doing it. And I, one year I was watching the guys do it, and somebody else come up was going to put their uh, their chairs up next to him. Says you can't go there. That's Dave Jones' uh, space. People, we never did anything with promoting that. The only rule we had about the chairs is you had to keep them off, off the ground so that we could mow and keep the weeds down. Uh, but the people would take care of themselves. That's where, that's where John sits and John sat there forever. Uh, one year we uh, tried to, when, after we first got our liquor licenses, which was a battle, uh, I wanted to see if I could make some access available to fans outside of the outside of the grandstand, be able to go buy a beer. I mean, to add it there, I might as well buy it from us. <laughs> and I took down, clear at the west end of the front of the track, I'd set up an area where we were going to have it. Oh, that was open for for part of the licensed alcohol area. God, holy heck for that. One of the people that used to set their chief, their chairs in that area was a police chief, or a fire chief. He told me, Phil, if you don't do something to change this, I'm closing the place down. <laughs> and fire marchers knew that. <laughs> so that, that idea went completely away because you do not mess with the people sitting around the track. It's their, they own it. Uh, they treat the uh, they treat it as theirs. You know, you're mentioning one of the great traditions of the jug, and and coming in here, I noticed that there were chairs that were that were chained to the fence. Um, we've got to recognize that this is the middle of a pandemic. Yes. Uh, there's going to be a jug without any fans. Right. Um, I'm just wondering how that strikes you. Very sad. 
but we're gonna we're gonna get through it. The uh, the board and the racing committee has put together a, uh, a plan to do it without fans. We're gonna miss them. Uh, we're gonna do things to try to really beef up the simulcast show, so we get uh, participation there, because it means on the business side of it, butts and seats good and everything, but dollars through windows is very good. That's people betting on the race. And if you come to the track and bet uh, $20 on a, uh, on a race, on the average we're going to get 20% of that as our income, our take from that bet. Simulcast, we get 3%. There's a whole lot of difference between 3 cents and 20 cent races. Uh, so that'll be a challenge. We, we, we hope to have a much better simulcast program this year because nobody's going to be able to be there. Yeah. We're doing other things that uh, setting up deals with some of the uh, ADWs that's automatic deposit wagering to uh, feature the jug and our rest of our races. Uh, the uh, Horseman or the, the Horseman's group we have a we we'll have a Facebook page. We we do have a Facebook page uh, on the, on on Facebook for the jug, and we'll be running a live show on that the entire day, actually all week, uh, just talking and promoting as much as we can to get people to go to those ADWs, join, and bet on us. It'll be a first time experience for a lot of people because they want to be here. But we're going to be promoting that, and uh, hopefully that'll that'll help some. But it's going to be a very financial drain on the fair this year, because uh, that is our that is our main the two main things of income for the fair is the tickets we sell and the betting that is done. Uh, well, those are both gone <laughs> as far as on track. That's that's a lot of. Uh, that's a lot of finance that we will have to figure out what we're going to do. Now, there's some expenses we're not going to have to do uh, because we don't have the other fare and stuff. But it's still, it's going to be a very challenging year for the for the board to uh, to get through this year. Uh, but I think they'll do it, uh, and they'll come back strong next year. Because one of the things we got going for us here is the community. The community really likes the fare. They like the jug. They like what we do. So they'll come back next year. Hopefully, it's all done by then. But we don't know with this crazy, uh, crazy virus. Okay. Um, are there some traditions about the jug that you would never want to see changed? We've changed a lot over the years. Yeah, I know. And yeah. sometimes I've been. Uh, I've been the leader in some of those changes because my job, I was out there with all of the horsemen, I was out there with the traders, I would hear what they would want. It was getting, the training was changing, horses were changing. They were more for speed, less for endurance. And I would hear, you need to stop having the if necessary race. That's. Have we explained what the jug is? I, I think our people understand that okay. it could be three times in, a, in an afternoon. Yes, actually. Uh, or four. Or four. <laughs> Early on, it was four. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's one that we, I was, I was happy with that change. We got rid of the if necessary. That made more trainers, okay, I'm gonna, I can race my horse twice. Don't make me come back for that third and really overworking. Uh, one of the things that we always heard is, you know, if you drew the, the uh, we start eight across here, if you drew the nine or ten hole, they'd be in the second tier and they, they always claimed that that was hurting them, being back there. Uh, if you do the tenth hole, I even had a couple owners that would scratch them. Uh, so we went to the 
on the gate. So we can start a max of eight. And with that, we always had, we'd, we would start 30 horses max, 10, 10 in three divisions. So that causes a change to only running uh, three divisions of eight each, 24. We eliminated a number of horses that could, could be racing. Uh, had a couple di designs, setups where if more than 24 would enter, uh, the, how do I say, at least best horse would not be, uh, not be allowed. It was based on money earned. Everybody liked that change because they liked seeing their horse that they bet on on the gate, not stuck behind. One year we had, uh, I, run a, I, I ran a bet called the uh, uh, Jug Double, where you could bet on both divisions of the jug or three divisions of the jug, you could bet on all, you know, together. And uh, one year we had a 10 horse field and then, well, we had two 10 horse fields. The first race was won by the 10 horse. And the second race was won by the eight horse. So we were, uh, we were quite pleased with that to show that, the, you know, it really doesn't mean that much. It does mean a difference, but not, if you've got a good horse, you're gonna win anywhere. Uh, so that was fun to see that. Probably, uh, then we started, I started supplemental entries. Because at times we would have a good horse that was racing big in the, big in some of the big races, but was not eligible to be in the jug. Because to have your horse eligible for the jug, you have to nominate that uh, horse as a yearly. You gotta plop the money down then to say, I'm gonna race the horse in three years in the jug. And then there's a two-year-old payment and a three-year-old payment to keep that horse eligible. And sometimes a horse would come along, say it was a, uh, you know, especially maybe a Gelling or something that was not expected to be a good horse, really, just an average racing horse. And his career would show that, hey, this horse, because they can't always tell what the horse is going to do when they're one year old, this horse is going to be a top horse. So we put in a ability to supplement a horse in, say, if you, and at first it was just if you won the uh, uh, the North America Pepsi Cup in Canada, if you won the uh, Kane, the Messenger, or if you won the Meadowland Pace, then you could make your supplemental payment to put your horse into the jug, and that was not a cheap cheap number. It's forty five thousand dollars they had to do. So you had to be pretty confident that your horse was strong enough to to do it to plop down forty forty five thousand to start with. We've had. Uh, We've had a number of horses do it over the years. Had three of them win. Uh, the other two were, were second. So they made their money back. Uh, and the fans really enjoyed it. I remember one time we had a horse called, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but he was a fantastic horse, but he could not, could not race. This was years ago. Wasn't eligible for the jug. And the media gave us a lot of crap for that because there's the best horse in the country and you won't let him race in the jug. Well, not, the rules are, and he wasn't you know, able to. That's why we changed some of those rules. So make sure that we could possibly get the best horses in the race so that they're representative of, they are the best that year. Uh, of course, getting rid of the if necessary is what we called it, bringing the horse back the third time. I don't ever want to see heat racing go away for the jug. Uh, that is part of the big tradition. Sure. And it's also part of Tandabrit. They are, they are known for their endurance. It's what sets them, that's why they're a standard bred. It's where they couldn't name come from. They, they race a mile in a standard, you know, you know, you see a thoroughbred race, you got eight thurlongs or half mile or mile and a half, et cetera, et cetera. We race one mile, so you can always compare 
what that horse has done each train. You ever go to a thoroughbred race? Try to look back and try to pick a horse when they've all raced at different distances. It's hard to, it's hard. Uh, another thing we got, we, we, we received complaints about, we've done a uh, redesign of the purse distribution. Uh, it was, I don't know how they ever came up with the first one, but you would take the total purse of the jug and pull out an X amount that was reserved for the ultimate winner. And then you would take what was left from that, you'd take 50% of that and put that in the final. Then the other 50% or 40% that was going to the uh, uh, divisions. So if there were three divisions, they were getting a third of the 40. It was, it was quite complicated. And so it is. Well, we've changed that. Actually, I think this is the first year we're going to race on the new, new purse, purse rules. Uh, we're taking the the divisions, each one of the divisions will race for 50000 Then the final will be for the remaining, which will be, it will make them, it will make the purse for the final much bigger. We had a lot of people look at that as important too. That, that purse distribution is going to help. One of the problems we have that sometimes is that if you finish third in your heat, and you draw it, you're going to come back at the uh, seven, hole, seven hole or the nine hole. Uh, a lot of drivers, trainers, owners will say, now nah, I'm scratching it. So we're taking 1% of the purse will go to every participant that comes back. So they're guaranteed of some money if you put your horse on that track and race it. Hopefully that's in hope to, to get a full field rather than two or three scratching out. Yeah. Makes the race a whole lot better. So that, uh, that's just some of the changes we've done. And okay. um, let me just ask for um, your response to this question. Um, in order for the jug to continue, or, are there some things that you think ought to be changed, need to be changed? In my opinion, the, the, the processes of racing, the race, et cetera, we've made all the changes that need to be made to keep up with the industry as a whole. Okay. Uh, who knows what's going to happen in the future? Uh, but we have to stay, we have to stay up with the industry as a whole. So I wouldn't have any idea, but things may come up differently. And if they do, we'll certainly try to accommodate the industry as a whole, but still maintain our tradition of what we do. It's a challenge sometimes, but it works. Okay. I'm going to say thank you for t to this point. Um, we may want to come back and finish up the interview. Okay. Um, because you have notes and I have questions, and uh, I wouldn't want those to just go away. But uh, Phil, thank you very much for, for making time, for doing You're so many, uh, to put so much thought into your answers. We really appreciate it. So, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.